A Critical Examination of the Theology of Karl Rahner, Jesuit, by Robert C. McCarthy. Acknowledgements. I am very much in debt to Mr. Attila Sinki Guimares, not only for his generous foreword, but also for his kind suggestions for correcting and improving the text. It has been a special pleasure to be able to call upon the professional services of three of my children to complete this work. Paul, for publishing and editing, Lillianne, copy editing, and Ellen, languages and New Testament. The final text, however, reflects my own decisions, and any deficiencies must be attributed to me alone. The two books upon which I rely heavily, Understanding Karl Rahner by Herbert Vorgrimler and Karl Rahner, An Introduction to His Theology by Karl Heinz Weger, were originally published in German by Verlag Herde, K.G. Freiburg, Germany, and the English versions were published by Crossroad Publishing Company and by the Seabury Press, respectively. The Crossroad Publishing Company informs me that its rights to the Vorgrimler and Weger books have expired. Verlag Herde claims the original and residual copyright to these books and has generously granted permission for extensive quotations from them. Despite specific requests, neither Crossroad Publishing nor Verlag Herder were able to provide information that would enable this author to contact the translators of these books from German to English, Mr. John Bowden and Search Press Limited, respectively. If the translators desire further recognition in future printings, the author would welcome being contacted by them. Forward one who wants to synthesize the ecclesiastical thinking in the conciliar and post-conciliar phase of the Catholic Church can present three main systems defended by three theologians. The Christogenesis of Teilhard de Chardin, the Theology of Love of Hans Urs von Balthasar, and the Anthropological Reduction or Transcendental Anthropology of Karl Rahner. Teilhard extends theology to all of human knowledge and all of created reality. In the philosophical field, he assumes the unproved premises of scientific evolution and composes his well-known cosmogenesis, the evolution of the universe. According to him, the material universal evolution ascends toward the rational process of man. This is his nuogenesis, the genesis of understanding. And in the present phase of man on earth, Everything tends, in an evolutionary sense, toward Christ, thence his Christogenesis. From matter to spirit, from spirit to Christ, everything would evolve in this direction, in an irreversible way, following laws that he seeks to explain. At the end of the process, creation would be incorporated with Christ, from whom it would initially have proceeded without an essential difference between creature and creator. The beginning integrated with the end, Christ the Alpha, Christ the Omega. This is the perfect cycle that Teilhard offers in his system. Evil itself would be an accident, a force of sliding friction that in involuntary way naturally impedes the march of evolution. Such philosophical premises are transposed onto all the truths of faith. Grace, the sacraments, the Mass, the Eucharist, the last things, dogmas, everything is explained in function of Christogenesis. The system attracts, by its clarity, largest of vision, radicality, and poetical sense. But at the same time, the system fails by virtue of its easy identification with philosophical immanentism condemned by the Catholic Church. What von Balthasar assumes as the presupposition of a system is the primacy of love in relation to reason, of the will in relation to intelligence, of charity in relation to faith. He also pays tribute to philosophical evolutionism, not the linear and positive evolution of Teilhard, but the dialectical and tragic evolution of Hegel. History would be the struggle between two principles, justice and mercy represented respectively by God the Father and God the Son. 
Jesus Christ would have become incarnate in order to defeat the supremacy of justice, faith, and logic, and to replace them with mercy, charity, and charm. Evil itself and those who are bad would not be capable of resisting the force of the attraction of love. Judas, heretics, those condemned to hell, and even the demons themselves would feel understood by this irresistible message of love and would have appeared to it in the depths of their hearts. Peter, yes, but John more than Peter. John, yes, but Dismas, the good feet, more than John. Dismas, yes, but Gesdras, the bad thief, more than Dismas. And thus, from the strength of love and mercy, the institutional church is displaced by the church of love, and the latter, in turn, is displaced by the church of the condemned. Those would be more united to Christ at the height of the cross than the others. In order to prove these points, von Balthasar makes use of a notable historical, philosophical, and artistic erudition, which confers to his system a broad visualization, attractive to romantic spirits, and much in vogue in these sad days of unbridled ecumenism, the theology of love nonetheless suffers from the fundamental error of subordinating faith to charity. Only one of the consequences of this is that of Catholic dogmas are now abdicated in favor of the union of the various religions. Rahner follows his master, the existentialist Martin Heidegger. For Rahner, what matters is that which exists here and now. Faith would need to cast off its abstract formulations in order to be accepted by today's man, such as he is. For this reason, all of theology either should be reduced to the human dimension, thence his anthropological reduction, or man should be raised up to the divine dimension from this his transcendental anthropology. His system is known under these two names. Here I put aside my pen with pleasure in order to introduce another analysis of Rahner's thought, a critical examination of the theology of Karl Rahner by Robert C. McCarthy. To fully appreciate the importance of this work, a word about the role played by the thinking of Karl Rahner is indispensable. The influence of Rahner at the Ecumenical Council of Vatican II was greater than that of the two preceding theologians. First, because the two others were not present. Teilhard died in 1955, and von Balthasar could not participate because of the publication of his work, Raising the Bastions, which at that time was considered very radical and progressive. Second, because the ideas of Rahner strongly influenced the German bishops, who were very well prepared and active during the council. These bishops maintained powerful associations of financial aid to the diocese of the third world, a quite important political detail. With this, they influenced a large number of other prelates to approve their favorite projects in the conciliar assembly. Third, Rahner was one of the authors of the dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, among others, the concepts of the church as a mystery and people of God, as accepted by Vatican II, are attributed to him. With this glance at the importance of Rahner in today's ecclesiastical thinking, the reader can easily understand how welcome is the work, a critical examination of the theology of Karl Rahner, Jesuit, by Robert McCarthy. In it, the author synthesizes with notable intelligence, and in acute Catholic sense, the thinking of the German theologian, and provides an objective critique of many of his erroneous points. The study, which does not pretend to be an exhaustive analysis of Rahner's system, presents the points most opposed to the Catholic faith. As an ex-marine, the author knows where to direct the torpedoes that will sink the ship. The work avoids confusing technical terms and concepts, and thus has the advantage of being easily understood. Another merit of the book is that Mr. McCarthy presents his synthesis based on the works of the disciples of Rahner, or on credible critical works that explain his thinking. If he had based it directly on the writings of Rahner, it would have resulted in a very large volume instead of this accessible and brief study that achieves an analogous result. For Rahner, normally uses difficult language, 
filled with neologisms of existentialist philosophy in order to express thinking that is not always clear. Thus, Robert C. McCarthy renders a commendable service to the Catholic cause in publishing this first study. It is to be hoped that others similar to it will follow, so that the main errors of Karl Rahner and other theologians will become more widely known. It only remains for me to congratulate the author for his meritorious work and to wish him a broad diffusion of this useful and opportune study. Written October 19, 2000 Attila Sinki Guimareres. Mr. Guimareres is a native of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and has spent the past 18 years studying Vatican II and its effects on the Catholic Church. For this purpose, he has traveled and studied widely, including periods in Rome. He has written an 11 volume collection on Vatican II, which is being translated from Portuguese to English. To date, two of these volumes have been published. The first, the now well-known In the Murky Waters of Vatican II, and the second, the recently released Animus Delendi, Desire to Destroy. This collection also includes the publication of special editions, short works on timely religious topics. The book Quo Vadis Peter, Where Goest Thou Peter, on the Holy See's interreligious initiatives for the year 2000, was the first of the special issues. These books are available from Tradition and Action. Part 1. Introduction. The Importance of Karl Rahner. Why should we examine the theology of Karl Rahner? The Catholic who is concerned about the present-day ecclesiastical crisis should know about the principal theories of the thinkers who influenced Vatican Council II. This work was written to help fill this need, inasmuch as Karl Rahner has been called the most influential theologian at Vatican II. Father Ralph Wiltgen wrote, Since the position of the German-language bishops was regularly adopted by the European alliance, and since the alliance position was generally adopted by the council, a single theologian might have his views accepted by the whole council if they had been accepted by the German-speaking bishops. There was such a theologian, Father Karl Rahner, Jesuit. Cardinal Frings, in private conversation, calls Father Rahner the greatest theologian of the century. Rahner's student and friend, Johann Baptist Metz, wrote, By the time he died, he had become probably the most important and influential Catholic theologian of his day. Metz has been further quoted as saying, Karl Rahner has renewed the face of our theology. Nothing is quite as it was before him. Cardinal Ratzinger, an early collaborator with Rahner, who, however, broke with him in the course of Vatican II, describes the impact of Rahner's theology on many. The broadly outlined thesis of Rahner's has something dazzling, something stupendous about it. The particular and universal history and being seem to be reconciled. A priest friend of mine who attended seminary in the southwest U.S. in the 70s said that in the seminary instruction, everything was Rahner, Rahner was in, Aquinas was out. As an example, he cited the preface to Jean Macquarie's Principles of Christian Theology. In this preface, progressivist Macquarie says, for many of the philosophical categories employed in this book, I am indebted to the writings of Martin Heidegger. Among contemporary theologians, I have found Karl Rahner the most helpful. In saying this, I am acknowledging that the leadership in theology, which even ten years ago lay with such Protestant giants as Barth, Brunner, Tillich, has now passed to Roman Catholic thinkers, among them Karl Rahner himself. A penetrating student of Heidegger is outstanding. He handles in a masterly way those tensions which constitute the peculiar dialectics of theology mentioned above. Faith and reason, tradition and novelty, authority and freedom, and so on. Rahner's influence is difficult to escape, if for no other reason than the sheer volume of the work that he and his associates 
produced over a period of some forty years. One bibliography lists, although doubtless with some duplications, over 3,700 articles or books attributed to him and his associates. Long before the council, and in anticipation of it, Rahner and his associates prepared 101 discussion papers titled Questionis Disputate, Disputed Questions. These were widely circulated and had a very great influence in Europe. Nothing of this kind of preparation for the council was undertaken in other areas of the world, certainly not in the United States. In the face of this overwhelming production, Anne Roche Muggeridge had commented, He is too profound, too original, too complex to be easily categorized, and his output was so prodigious that it will be some time before it can be fully assessed by the Church. It is in post-conciliar developments that we can see his great influence, especially in ecumenism, and the purported influence of the Holy Ghost in all religions, that the guidance of the Holy Ghost in the Catholic Church is not superior to its guidance to the individual lay person. The explosion of the diaconate, the emphasis upon the priesthood of the laity, the marginalization of the consecrated priesthood, the undermining of the authority of the papacy, the contempt for religious teaching authority, the questioning of scripture and miracles, the acceptance and promotion of social and psychological analysis as true science. All of these are elements of, or arise directly out of, Rahner's theology. In view of his acknowledged influence, can we afford to wait for a future assessment? Part 2. Historical Background most readers will be shocked by the radical nature of Rahner's theology, and that a Jesuit priest could have constructed a system that is, quite fundamentally, anti-Catholic. The political and social context of the early and mid-1900s, however, serve to help understand, if not justify, Rahner's extremism. It is easy, especially for Americans, to forget the deep trauma of World War I, in which England, France, and Germany lost the flower of their manhood and the brutal trenches with long-lasting political and cultural consequences. Following this initial trauma, there was unleashed the heretofore unheard of ferocity of World War II, with total war against civilians as well as the military forces, deepening the disillusionment and despair of many in Europe. Germans, like Rahner and Ratzinger, who had to live under the Nazi regime, understandably felt an acute sense of failure and guilt. Johann Baptist Metz, who was forced into the German army at age 16, described his desolation on finding his company overrun by a combined bomber and tank assault. I could see only dead and empty faces, where the day before I had shared childhood fears and youthful laughter. Behind this memory, all my childhood dreams crumble away. A fissure had opened in my powerful Bavarian Catholic socialization with its impregnable confidence. It is therefore again understandable, if not forgivable, that Cardinal Ratzinger should say that the pre-Vatican II Church, in its attempt to guard and defend the faith, had failed. Subnote Joseph Ratzinger, in an address given at the conclusion of Vatican II, republished by a Reservatore Romano on December 8, 1995, excerpts from which were printed in the December 1995 issue of Inside the Vatican Magazine. In this address, Ratzinger said, This council signals the passage from a situation in which it seemed that the highest level of Christianization had been reached and in which the greatest task was to guard and defend the faith, to another situation in which the Church needed once again to accept a radical existence as a minority and what was required was not conservation but missionary existence. The attempt to safeguard a presumed or real combination has failed. Against this political and social background, the early and mid-1900s also witnessed a continued fragmentation of philosophy and theology, 
Protestants, Barth, Tillich, Bultmann, and others became dominant. The historical critical method had called into question the historical validity of the New Testament. Scientism and Darwinian evolution had become generally accepted, and Teilhard de Chardin, another Jesuit, had constructed our Darwinian evolutionary theology of cosmogenesis, biogenesis, anthropogenesis, Christogenesis, and neugenesis, in which everything, even Christ, is in the state of becoming. Learned people had generally accepted science as the standard for the acceptance of any truth, and social science was being accepted as a genuine science. Karl Heinz Weger summarizes the problem as conceived by Rahner. What meaning could concepts such as grace and redemption, the incarnation of God, heaven, and hell, original sin, the Trinity, and the Immaculate Conception have for those working at the conveyor belt or in the office? There was, then, obviously a crisis of faith and its presentation. From this new necessity, a new method had to be found. Rahner, in this environment, felt the need to reconstruct theology, to meet the demands of the modern mind. He himself demanded a theology that he could understand a relationship with God that he could explain to himself. He needed to rationalize his religion. He sympathized with Bultmann's efforts to demythologize Christianity, that is, to eliminate the miraculous. In this environment, and with this necessity, Rahner constructed this new theology. Part 3. The Problem of Interpreting Karl Rahner Miss Muggridge says that Karl Rahner was too complex, too profound. Perhaps... More likely is that he found it necessary to be obscure in order to f avoid condemnation. It would have been disastrous for him to be expelled from the church. He would have lost his teaching position, his livelihood, the support of his associates, and access to the publishing facilities allied with the church. Rahner not only invented a new theology, he invented a new language to describe it. It became, in effect, a coded language understandable only to initiates. In order to decode Rahner, it is necessary to a large extent to go outside of Rahner himself and depend upon others who are willing to interpret him. Although there are few and fair number of books in English that attempt to explain Rahner from a supportive, even enthusiastic point of view, I have not found any in English that examine his theology from a critical point of view. Inasmuch as Rahner was in fact criticized and threatened with disciplinary measures during most of his career, there no doubt exists extensive critiques in the archives of the Vatican and in the Italian, French, and German languages, but these are not accessible to this author. It is to be hoped that some scholar will discover these writings and make them available in English. The only really useful criticism in English that I have found is a brief discussion in Cardinal Ratzinger's book, Principles of Catholic Theology, to which I will refer to later. But this is a limited commentary on one particular thesis of Rahner, and it is no way a detailed examination. With these limited resources, I have been blessed with the insight of a priest friend, who must unfortunately remain anonymous who provided me with the basic key to understanding Rahner. As to literary sources, I have depended mainly upon the expositions of Herbert Vorgrimler, Understanding Karl Rahner, and Karl Heinz Weger, Karl Rahner, An Introduction to His Theology, both of whom were students and close associates of Rahner. Both of these books are admirably forthright in their exposition of Rahner. Before I quote extensively, from these two works, and to spare the reader from two extensive footnotes, I will frequently indicate the author and page in the text with the quotation. In my exposition of Rahner's theology, I will first state my understanding of his intent, and follow this with quotations from his associates, or from Rahner himself, to support my interpretation. Part 4. Methodology. Rahner contra St. Thomas. Weger has called Rahner's method to be the anthropological approach. Rahner, he says, 
does this by testing that traditional teaching about faith against man's experience of himself in the world. Weger describes this method as follows. Rahner asked, How does contemporary man understand himself at all? How does he react to experience? All of these and other questions are asked by Rahner, and they form the point of departure for his theology. It is therefore quite correct to speak of an anthropological approach, an approach based firmly on man. Rahner's first step towards overcoming the process of incrustation and ossification of Christian teaching has therefore been a hard and unrelenting confrontation between concrete and dogmatic pronouncements and the experience of contemporary man. In this way, then, Rahner breaks radically with the traditional theology of the Church, which should not begin from below, that is, with man himself, but has always insisted that dogmatic statements had to be taught to man in the form in which they had been received in the Church. Rahner's approach is quite different. Man is at the beginning for him, not the Church's statement of faith. Reger further comments, Rahner himself has said that theology often gives the impression nowadays of providing mythological or at least unscientific answers. The theologian can only overcome this by beginning with man and his experiences. In direct contrast to the man-centered approach of Rahner, St. Thomas, following tradition, based his theology upon the revealed truths concerning the nature of God and of man, and was therefore theocentric rather than anthropocentric. St. Thomas certainly did not ignore the nature of man. In fact, he fully and fruitfully utilized the analysis of human nature inherited from the Greeks. But St. Thomas always balanced and checked this rational analysis against the truce of revelation. Another difference between Rotter and St. Thomas is found in their basic methodologies. The methodology of St. Thomas is an open one, as suggested by Alice Dare McIntyre, which could be very useful even in these modern times. The Thomistic system is open because of its special features. First of all, St. Thomas suggests a proposition. He then mobilizes all of the arguments against this proposition in current and past literature. Then he proposes his own solution and sets out his arguments for that solution. This is, then, a methodology that allows new arguments to be introduced. The basic requirement, as McIntyre points out, is that there be a common language, i.e., that terms used be reducible to agreed meanings, a condition lamentably absent in the Tower of Babel of today's philosophies. To be fair, Rahner did not claim to have constructed a system of theology, but this denial does not enhance his theology. Rahner's theology is really no more than a series of assumptions built upon one fundamental assumption, and it leaves large gaps in the process. Rahner does not test his assumptions against revelation. He, in fact, ignores and contradicts revelation. Moreover, Rahner does not even test his propositions against reasonable objections, as St. Thomas does. Rahner plows his path with nary a look to the right or left. Rahner's theology is therefore exceptionally vulnerable being a series of awkward assumptions that can be easily challenged. The Summa of St. Thomas, on the other hand, is a monumental edifice, logically integrated, built carefully, piece by piece, by proposing, analyzing, and suggesting solutions to approximately 3,400 propositions concerning the nature of and relationship between man and God. Part 5. The Theology of Karl Brunner Rahner's theology has been referred to as transcendental anthropology. Again, as transcendental and anthropological, another author says, His approach to theology is often said to be transcendental, even as his method is rooted in the anthropological and experiential. In the following sections, we will explain and develop these ideas. But we will begin with a single segment of Rahner's thinking, that is particularly illuminating. A. Rahner's view of the future church. Ordinarily, this section, Rahner's view of the future church, 
would be at the end of this exposition as the culmination of his theology. However, it is introduced here for two reasons. First, it introduces the reader to the fundamental anti-Catholicism of Rahner, and secondly, it is supported by unusually clear statements by Rahner himself. The basic idea of Rahner is that the church, lowercase, is a society of believers. The implications of this are enormous. The first implication is that it is not an organization established by Christ, that Christ did not designate a head of this organization, that the successors to the apostles are not endowed with unusual authority and powers, that, to the contrary, authority in the church can only be confirmed by the assent of the lay faithful. In support of this interpretation, the quotations from Rahner himself are given below. These are taken from the book Call Rahner, edited by Jeffrey B. Kelly. The quotation of Rahner in the Kelly book are excerpted from Rahner's book The Shape of the World to Come, and specifically from his chapter on a declericalized church. The church of the future must grow in its reality quite differently from the past, from below from groups of those who have come to believe as a result of their own free, personal decision. Then what is meant here by declericalization may become clear. Office of priests, bishop, archbishops, cardinals, and popes will exist in a church growing from below this way, really and not merely theoretically emerging from the free decision of faith on the part of individuals. Official authority in the future will not longer be effective in virtue of powers of a society belonging to office in advance of this obedience of faith as it is today, but to a constantly diminishing extent. In practice, in future, the office holder will have as much effective authority as is conceded to them freely by believers through their faith. Authority will always have to consist in an appeal to the free act of faith of each individual and must be authorized in light of this act. The church is a declericalized church in which the believers gladly concede to the office holders in free obedience the special functions in a society. The penultimate paragraph above states Rahner's position very clearly. Office holders, i.e. priests, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, and popes, will have as effective authority as is conceded to them by believers. Authority will always have to consist in an appeal to the free act of faith of each individual. Rahner makes it clear that the special right which we call the sacrament of holy orders in no way alters the declericalized concept of office in the church. In the future, questions or doubts about office will no longer be effectively dismissed by appealing to formal authority of office but only by furnishing proof of a genuinely Christian spirit on the part of the office holders themselves. Vorgrimler comments, The new clergy would have to be capable of doing professional, secular work of earning their living, which would avoid the impression of sacrality remote from the world. This view of the Catholic Church effectively denies a that Christ established a human institution with a visible head, b. that authority did not descend from the apostles, c. that priests do not receive special sacramental powers from such succession, d. therefore the sacraments of the church have no special meaning or effectiveness. It is, as one can see, a thoroughly Protestant position. The idea that the traditional hierarchy has no privileged position as expressed in Vorgrimler's statement. The church has infinite dimensions because it is the believing community of human beings who are filled with the Spirit of God. Vatican II absorbed at least some of this theology in its identifying the church with the people of God, as in the astonishing statement in Lumen Gentium, paragraph 12. The holy people of God shares also in Christ's prophetic office. The whole body of the faithful who have an anointing that comes from the Holy One cannot err in matters of belief. This is consistent with Rahner's idea of the future church, and that ordained priests and instituted hierarchy have no authority inherently superior to the ordinary faithful. b. 
Bronner's non-traditional view of human nature, the supernatural existential, the basic building block of his theology. The first element of Rahner's theology is an assumption, an arbitrary assumption, inasmuch as there is no foundation for it in the canon of Revelation, concerning the nature of mankind. It is, in fact, a total contradiction of the traditional view of human nature. In order to understand the radical nature of Rahner's construction, it will be useful to describe the traditional view of the human condition. As Anne Roach Muggeridge describes it, the belief that we are all fallen, we are equally stricken, our intellect darkened, our will weakened and inclined to evil, our bodies subject to disease and death. The belief that Christ atoned for us to God gives us a second chance, destroys despair. St. Thomas has this to say about human nature. Man's nature may be looked at in two ways. First, in its integrity as it was in our first parent before sin, secondly, as it is corrupted in us. In the state of corrupted nature, man falls short even of what he can do by his nature, so that he is unable to fulfill it by his own natural powers. And thus, man needs a gratuitous strength superadded to natural strength. For two reasons, in the state of corrupt nature, vis-a-vis, -vis, in order to be healed, and furthermore, in order to carry out works of supernatural virtue, which are meritorious. Summa Theologia 1, 2, Question 109, Article 2. It will also be useful to relate St. Thomas' description of man at the time of creation. The very rectitude of the primitive state wherewith man was endowed by God seems to require that, was created in grace. God made man right. For this rectitude consisted in his reason, being subject to God, the lower powers to reason and the body to the soul. It is clear that also the primitive subjection by virtue, of which reason was subject to God, was not merely natural gift, but a supernatural endowment of grace. If we attempt to paraphrase St. Thomas, it was this controlling balance of reason and will over body, by virtue of grace that allowed man in his original state to be at peace with God. And it was this balance that was destroyed by the original alienation of sin. Rahner's theology, on the contrary, assumes a whole, intact, integral, and unchanged, uncorrupted, and not fallen nature of man since the first manifestation of men whenever that might have been, and the question whether or not mankind began with an Adam and an Eve. Subnote, for Grimler, various articles by Rahner came into being on the relationship between the Christian view of creation and evolutionary thought in the natural sciences, on the burden of damnation for humanity and monogenism, the doubtful view that humanity descended from just one human couple. End subnote. Rahner denies the traditional view of the nature of man in two respects. First of all, he denies that supernatural grace is added to basic human nature. Secondly, he denies that there was any rupture of the balance between grace, reason, soul, and body. Although Rahner does not say so explicitly, his theology implicitly denies original sin. A further inescapable conclusion is that he denies the necessity for redemption. How, then, did Rahner construct his idea of an integral human nature that had never been compromised, never fallen? He couched this idea in the words, supernatural existential. By this he meant that every man, since the beginning of mankind, has within him a supernatural element that inclines him, unavoidably, like a magnet toward the supreme divine. No person is devoid of this supernatural attraction, and nothing has happened to mankind to interrupt or distract from this attraction. Rahner strongly objects to the traditional idea that grace can be taken from or added to the human condition. For Rahner, the supernatural existential takes the place of grace and is an inherent quality an inalienable quality, 
a priori, as Rahner would say, of the human condition. The following quotations are from the book by Karl Heinz Weger. The inner dynamism of man's spirituality, Rahner calls a supernatural existential factor in man. It is always supernatural, with the result that even the non-Christian performs supernatural actions. That is, actions which contain within themselves reference to a supernatural salvation in God. Grace is a reality that is always present at the very center of man's existence in knowledge and freedom and in mode of an offer which can be accepted or rejected. Man is not able in any way to abandon this transcendent peculiarity of his being. Because of this, anonymous Christianity exists everywhere. There is no religion of any kind in which God's grace, however suppressed it may be, and however depraved its expression may be, does not reveal itself in one way or another. Grace is no more or less than God himself dwelling at the very center of the existence of every man. As an offer, however, it is not. External to man, but also something which determines man to such an extent in his knowledge and freedom, that it continues to determine his existence when he refuses it. This state of being determines man's being, with the result that man's experience of himself is also an experience of God. The relationship between nature and grace has been traditionally presented in such a way that the two elements are seen as two carefully distinguished levels, one superimposed on the other and that the orientation of nature towards grace is viewed in a negative way. God's grace, when presented in this way, is seen as a superstructure added to the soul, or even as an ornament, and not as the real center of man's existence. In the sense of a supernatural existential factor, grace is always present for every man as a priori, as an offer made by God and as God's concrete will to save all men. This element is a reality in man, with the result that every man is dynamically finalized in the direction of God's grace. We cannot say, then, what man would be without God's grace, because we have never experienced ourselves without that grace, and because we are also determined by that grace even when we reject it in sin or guilt. The supernatural existential element in man is a concept that has been introduced into Catholic theology by Rahner to express the fact that every man, even the man who does not know or rejects God's categorical revelation, scriptures, is never simply natural man, but is always subject to the active and effective saving will of God. Turning to Rahner's own words, the following is taken from his Foundations of Christian Faith. Our basic statement does not refer to a statement which is valid only for this or that group of people as distinguished from others. For example, only for the baptized or the justified as distinguished from pagans and sinners. The statement that man is subject is the event of God's self-communication is a statement which refers to absolutely all men and which expresses an existential of every person. In this sense, everyone, really, and radically, every person, must be understood as the event of a supernatural self-communication of God. Rahner continues, It follows from this that God's offer of himself belongs to all men and is a characteristic of man's transcendence and his transcendentality. Rahner's denial of original sin and his idea that every person enjoys the fullness of grace and is determined by that grace even when we reject it in sin or guilt is a direct repudiation of the most fundamental teachings of the Catholic faith regarding the condition of mankind and the function of grace. C. Rahner's Experience of God Rahner's concept of the supernatural existential, as described in the foregoing section, was clearly derived from what he described as his own personal experience of God. Rahner, as quoted by Vorgrimler, stated, I have experienced God directly. I have experienced God 
the nameless and unfathomable one, the one who is silent and yet near. I have experienced God himself, not human words about him. Yet, when Rodder describes this experience of God, we find it extremely vague, nebulous, and generalized, so ordinary that it becomes very unconvincing. Where Grimler quotes Rodder describing how all men experience God. The experience of God happens to anyone in the midst of specific, ordinary, everyday experiences. In particular, events in which people suddenly find themselves torn away from dealing with quite ordinary matters and tasks and are thrown back on themselves. Life is full of events which have a mysterious nucleus. Taken by itself, a single event may not prove much. Perhaps a single experience of solitude or responsibility. What suddenly dawns on one is the inner voice of conscience. To make peace, to reject war and military service which is not allowed when he escaped, which intervenes in the whole of life and changes it. There are thousands such experiences in a human life, and underlying them all is the one primal experience, that man is more than the sum of chemical elements and processes, that human life rests on an incomprehensible mystery. This single basic experience of man is present in a thousand different forms. And the sheer density of that experience which is ultimate and yet present at the same time everywhere in our everyday lives. Now, if the real meaning of Rahner's experience of God is no more than that man is more than the sum of chemical elements and processes, that human life rests on an incomprehensible mystery, this is hardly a new and revolutionary idea on which to base a radical concept such as his supernatural existential. Every person has in fact his or her own idea of, or absence of, an experience of God. But few would dare to universalize their personal idea as Rahner presumed to do. The danger of universalizing from personal experience is well illustrated by the conflict between von Balthasar and Rahner. As Vorgrimler states, radically different experiences of God led to irreconcilable theological positions. D. Rahner's concept of the anonymous Christian. The concept of anonymous Christianity introduced by Rahner is probably the one idea of his that most profoundly influenced Vatican II and has had broad and long-lasting effects within the Church especially the ecumenism of Pope John Paul II. It undermines the idea of one true church. It displaces the apostolic description of the church in which Christ is the head, the Catholic church the body, and the faithful parts of the body, and dismisses what has always been recognized as the necessity to recognize, acknowledge, and commit oneself to Christ. In the section above dealing with the nature of man, we have seen that Rahner suggests that Grace, as supernatural existential, is a reality that is always present at the very center of man's existence, and anonymous Christianity exists everywhere. There is no religion of any kind in which God's grace, however suppressed it may be and however depraved its expression may be, does not reveal itself in one way or another. Weger gives this interpretation of Rahner. Every person and every religion attempts to objectivize the transcendental revelation of God and to express that revelation with the result that a partial expression of at least authentic, categorical, real revelation is contained in each religion. Religions and philosophies or worldviews arise in the first place from the inner dynamism of man's spirituality as manifested in his transcendental experiences. There are, in all religions, he believes, individual aspects of successful mediation made possible by God's grace of man's supernaturally transcendent relationship with God. Now, the Catholic Church has never declared that any man, even Judas or any group of men, is irredeemably condemned, that is left to God's judgment only. Moreover, the Church has always taught that those who, through no fault of their own, have not received the sacrament of baptism, 
can be saved through what is called baptism of blood or baptism of desire. Baltimore Catechism, number 3, paragraph 321. As unbaptized person receives the baptism of desire when he loves God above all things and desires all that is necessary for his salvation. Same reference, paragraph 323. Rahner departs from this teaching in holding that every person in every religion is directly linked to Christ through the innate and inescapable supernatural existential. Even though the private choice may be a rejection of Christ, or in the case of the atheist, a rejection of any god at all. Weger quite honestly reports that von Balthasar rejected Rahner's anonymous Christianity because it implies a relativization of the objective revelation of God in the biblical event and a sanctioning of the objective religious ways of other religions as ordinary and extraordinary ways of salvation. Weger also honestly reports that critics of Rahner maintain that to accept anonymous Christianity is to make a deep, perhaps fatal, incision into the whole Christian tradition and view of faith. If we examine Rahner's description of anonymous Christianity, its most evident characteristic is that it requires no recognition or acknowledgment of Christ. Yet this is precisely what Christ so clearly demanded. Every Christian is required to answer the question that Christ asked. Who do you say that I am? Being a Christian requires a definite, public decision for Christ. We recite the Credo at Mass as a public declaration of what we accept and believe. If a Christian is given the choice of public acceptance and martyrdom, or private acceptance and public renunciation, he must choose martyrdom. The necessity of public acceptance, as well as internal conversion, is repeatedly emphasized in the New Testament. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9 Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whosoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. Matthew 10.32-33 Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 3.18 At the name of Jesus every knee should bend, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2.9-11 We have received that grace of apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Romans 1.5 Jesus foretold terrible consequence for those who rejected him. Whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet. Amen, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. Matthew ten fourteen through 15 Nor did Jesus preach ecumenism, but rather predicted conflict between those who accepted him and those who rejected him. I have not come to bring peace but the sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and one's enemies will be those of his household. Matthew 10, 34-36 In the face of this clear New Testament teaching, we find in Rahner's theology, grace, supernatural existential, is no more or less than God himself dwelling at the very center of existence of every man which determines man to such an extent in his knowledge and freedom that it even continues to determine his existence when he refuses it. And we cannot say, then, what man would be without God's grace, because we have never experienced ourselves without that grace, and because we are also determined by that grace even when we reject it in sin or guilt. We might also note in this context, for later consideration, a quotation from Pope John Paul II. With regard to other religions, Christ the Savior is also mysteriously at work. Part E. Rahner's Concept of Self-Transcendence and Evolution It would appear that Rahner's view of transcendence and evolution does not necessarily flow from his concept of human nature, the supernatural existential. 
but is rather an expanded version of the supernatural existential. Thus he attributes to man not only a fundamental supernatural element in his nature, he further proposes that this supernatural element allows humans to transcend their basic nature. He then expands this concept of self-transcendence to history and the world of nature. Thus, while the basic theology of Rahner is not obviously evolutionary, he has, by this self-transcendence, made it fit into an evolutionary theology. In this way, he explains and supports the evolutionary theology of Teilhard de Chardin. Subscript Ratzinger in Principles Ratzinger gives this description of de Chardin. The impetus given by Teilhard de Chardin exerted a wide influence. With daring vision, it incorporated the historical movement of Christianity into the great cosmic process of evolution from Alpha to Omega. Since the noogenesis, since the formation of consciousness in the event by which man became man, this process of evolution has continued to unfold as the building of the noosphere, above the biosphere. This means that evolution takes place now in the form of technical and scientific development, in which, ultimately, matter and spirit, individual and society, will produce a comprehensive whole, a divine world. In the words of Rahner himself, we find, We assume that there is such a thing as an evolutionary view of the world, and that it is objectively well-founded. This presupposes a unity of spirit and matter. The history of the one world of matter and spirit may be regarded as the temporal history of self-transcendence. What is earlier and lower rises above, and beyond itself into what is later and higher and does so in virtue of the dynamism communicated to it by God's absolute being as the innermost center of the world. This divinization is an absolute final culmination of the history of nature, spirit and freedom, it is the self-transcendence of the world, and in it God himself. Vorgrimler puts this evolutionary view plainly. He learned to understand the history of God with the world and humanity as an evolutionary process which moves forward in qualitative leaps. From the inorganic to life, from the vegetative to consciousness, from the animal kingdom to the human world, from parents to the child, from humanity to God and man and Jesus of Nazareth, from death to consummation. He termed these leaps or transitions self-transcendence. Wegger's comments parallel those of Vorgrimler and Rahner. Rahner does not doubt the fact of evolution. He may even be the first theologian to have asked these questions that have arisen from the problem of evolution. These and similar questions have led to a new concept, that of man's active transcendence of himself as a created reality. He deals with man as a created being, producing more than can be explained by causes within this world alone. To further explain this presumed phenomenon, Wegger says that Rahner first made a reassessment of the relationship between matter and spirit. Second, he has attempted to draw attention to God's constant activity in his creation, especially in the datum of becoming. Wegger continues, because both matter and spirit are created by God, the difference between them cannot be an absolute one. There is, then, a close affinity and an inseparable unity between matter on the one hand and the spirit on the other. And, as a result of this, the possibility exists the matter may become spirit. This astonishing view of spirit and matter is breathtaking in its rejection of scriptural and traditional views of creation and a total acceptance of material evolution. From the inorganic life, from the vegetative, to the human world, to, to God and man. In this concept, man had no soul different from animals. And the soul in man, the supernatural existential of runner, is also found in nature, in matter. And if there is transcendence in man, it is also found in nature. One is stuck dumb by this arrogant casting aside of all of the lessons of the Old and New Testaments. 
Christ fits nowhere in this evolutionary scheme, which develops naturally from its own inherent self-transcendence and which will eventually reach perfection and the ultimate merging of spirit and matter through its own self-realization. The New Testament does not support the idea that this humanity and this material earth will evolve into a Telhardian perfection. For Peter says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire. But according to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Second Peter chapter 3, 10, chapter 3, 13. Likewise, St. John says, Next, I saw a large white throne, and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Apocalypse chapter 20, 11, and chapter 21, 1. Part F. Rahner's View of Scripture and Revelation. Rahner maintained that because of the fundamental supernatural element in man's nature, every person is capable of receiving and interpreting true revelation. Thus the Old and New Testaments are useful, but not absolutely necessary, vehicles for revelation. For example, for Grimler states, From his own experience there arose the basic theological conviction that God has revealed himself to every human being and that this is the authentic and most original form of revelation. For Rahner, it was the will of God himself that human beings should learn to interpret their experiences of God in the way that the Jewish Christian tradition of God interpreted them. Rahner also questioned the historicity of Scripture. For example, Weger says, It is seldom possible to say with any certainty which statements can be attributed to the historical Jesus, and which can only be ascribed to the theology of faith of the early church. Rahner, therefore, confines himself to minimal statements. The Gospels, he knows, are not biographies. They were formed by the faith and Easter experience of the disciples. Rahner has repeatedly asked whether it is possible to show that anything historical can be proved to be true. Is it possible to learn about what we are taught to believe as Christians in any way that is not based on being instructed by an external authority? Rahner calls scripture the objectivizing of a revelation, and Weger has these comments. God has allowed human guilt, and this has the effect of debasing and overshadowing all aspects of man's collective and social life. This is also the case in the history of man's objectivizing interpretation of God's revelation. This interpretation is only partially successful. It is always part of an unfinished history. It is mixed with air and contains obscurities. These determine the religious situation in which man is placed. For Grimler says pointedly, God has revealed himself to every human being and, therefore, Revelation does not need special bearers of the mystery who control it. By giving this interpretation of revelation, Rahner overturns and tramples on the very meaning of revelation, which is the disclosure by the divine will of what would be otherwise inaccessible to human reason. Indeed, many of the doctrines of our faith are mysteries that we cannot fully understand, even when they are revealed and must be accepted on faith alone. It is interesting that the nature of revelation is question number one of the Summa of St. Thomas, in which he says, It was necessary for man's salvation that there should be a knowledge revealed by God, besides philosophical science built up by human reason. It was necessary for the salvation of man that certain truths, which exceed human reason, should be made known to him by divine revelation. Man's whole salvation, which is in God, depends upon the knowledge of this truth. For many things are shown to thee above the understanding of man. Ecclesiasticus chapter 3, 
25. Part 1, Question 1, Article 1. Yet Rahner had the basic conviction that God has revealed himself to every human being, and that this is the authentic and most original form of revelation, equal to the Old and New Testaments. Part G, Rahner's view of the nature of Jesus Christ. Rahner's view of Christ fully reflects the basic orientation of his theology as being anthropocentric, that is, built upward from man, rather than theocentric, built from an understanding of God through revelation. It is in his view of the nature of Jesus Christ that Rahner is most circumspect. The nature of Christ, two natures, divine and human in one person, was defined by the Council of Chalcedon, and for Rahner, to openly challenge this dogma would have instantly made him a heretic. But it seems fair to conclude that Rahner considered Jesus to be essentially a human being, his uniqueness being in the full realization of the potential of his supernatural existential so that he was accepted by God and absorbed into God. And by accepting Jesus, God accepted humanity. And one of Rahner's interpretations God, by this acceptance, irrevocably became man. Rahner taught that the appearance of such a man as Jesus could have predicted, i.e., that some man, at some time, would achieve the full realization of his potential as Jesus did. And if Jesus had not appeared in history, it could be predicted that some such person would appear in the future. The best description of Rahner's view of Jesus Christ that I have found is in Cardinal Ratzinger's book, Principles of Catholic Theology. This is an exposition by the Cardinal that he will later criticize. He says, For Bronner, man is, in fact, self-transcendent being. Hence the God-man can be deduced as the true savior of mankind in terms of man's own being. The incarnation of God is the highest instance of the ontological fulfillment of human reality the successful, perfect transcendence. As a successful form of human self-transcendence, or in other words, as the utterance of God in a finite subject, Christ, the expression and realization of the human universal. Weger evidently is quoting Rahner in the following. It is possible to believe that man, Jesus of Nazareth, since everything that has been said about God and man's experience of God about transcendental revelation and historical interpretation, and about man's longing and fears, is mysteriously synthesized in the encounter with Jesus of Nazareth. All of the following quotations are from Weger. Rahner has shown that Jesus was seen to be with God in a unique way. It is only quite recently that attempts have been made to express this mystery of the incarnation of God in a new way that may be more readily intelligible to modern man than the earlier biblical and Hellenistic formulations. If it was possible to translate, as it were, the mystery of the Incarnation into words, Chalcedon can surely not be the end. It is indeed not the last word, but an invitation to begin again. The first difficulty, the danger of a mythological misunderstanding, there are, after all, incarnations in almost all religions. The idea of Christ can be gained from the a priori structure of man. This idea of Christ has therefore, according to Rahner, to be deduced from man's understanding of himself. Man, therefore, looks out in his history to see whether he cannot find the highest fulfillment of his being and his expectations. Man is therefore, in the sense, the one who can expect the free epiphany of God in his history. That epiphany is Jesus Christ. What strikes us, if we go more deeply into Rahner's Christology, is that it is not only in accordance with his anthropological approach, but also that he prefers the term absolute bringer of salvation to the concept of incarnation. Rahner varies the name, calling Jesus in addition to the absolute bringer of salvation, the mediator of salvation, the last prophet, or the last of prophets. He also speaks of the saving event, meaning Jesus Christ.
It should be noted that Rahner does not refer to Christ as the Redeemer. This is consistent with his basic theology of the wholeness, the integrity, and uncorrupted nature of man, which would not need redemption from original sin. Weger remarks on Rahner's anxiety to avoid at all costs any suspicion of mythology that might be caused by the doctrine of the Incarnation. His Christology, which he often calls Christology from below, is therefore an approach made from the standpoint of man and his understanding of himself. What later became known as the result of Jesus rising from the dead, namely that the whole Jesus of Nazareth, including his humanity, was accepted by God. Rahner presupposes, for example, that God is himself man and continues to be man in eternity. If God is always a mystery, then man is also the mystery of God and will continue to be mystery in eternity. God's act of salvation, achieved by the absolute bringer of salvation, is irrevocable because God can never cease to be man. The event of salvation is irreversible. It is in itself the fulfillment of salvation to such a degree that, although it has been accomplished in an exemplary way in one man, the salvation of that one is at the same time the possibility of salvation and indeed salvation itself for all men. The bringer of salvation must therefore be God's absolute promise to the spiritual creature, man, at the same time the acceptance of God's communication of himself by the bringer of salvation. The aim of a transcendental Christology is to make the Incarnation intelligible, not on the basis of mythological ideas. For example, that God assumed human nature, through which he acted simply as though he was hiding behind a mask, but rather from the point of view of man himself. In the last quotation above, we find that Rahner denies that God assumed human nature, the very definition of Incarnation. Without that belief, that a manifestation of the Supreme Being, the third person of the Trinity, the Word, the Son of God, emptied himself and took on the flesh and nature of man, Christianity would collapse. Part H. Rahner's View of Demythologizing the Catholic Faith Weger wrote, He, Rahner, has not hesitated to apply Bultmann's highly charged word demythologization to Catholic theology. He also pointed emphatically to the almost completely unsuitable nature of the traditional statements about faith. Rudolf Bultmann was a Protestant thinker who absolutely rejected any kind of mysteries, that is, events that could not be explained in scientific or natural terms. Rahner, inasmuch as he was constantly testing the very edges of orthodoxy, and risking condemnation by the Roman Curia, and was at times subjected to censorship until he was rehabilitated by John the Twenty-Third, did not dare to directly adopt the same forthright position as Boltzmann. In the introduction to this commentary, there was mention of Jean Macquarie's Principles of Christian Theology as a major textbook in Catholic seminaries. It is relevant here to note that Macquarie says in his preface, Rudolf Bultmann has remained my principal guide in understanding of the New Testament. Rahner's more cautious, indirect course was to suggest new interpretations of these events that could be acceptable to the modern mind. Many of us have heard homilies in the post-Vatican II church that explains the miracle of the loaves and fishes as a miracle of charity in which Jesus inspired the five thousand to share what they had intended to keep themselves. For Rahner, this would be a miracle of charity, but it perverts entirely the traditional view of such an event as a true miracle. A typical example is that of Rahner's interpretation of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Vorgrimler relates, The second part of this work describes the history of the doctrine that Mary was taken up into heaven, body and soul, a doctrine which can be found for the first time in legends of the fifth century. Here is an attempt to affirm the dogma fully and completely, and yet to tone down several points in a way which is called for 
in view of the scantiness of the sources, the great lack of faith in the 20th century, and the explosion caused in the ecumenical sphere. Bronner attempts to think in terms of a total view of a man. In short, according to this view, Mary would not be an individual case, but every dead person would be taken up by God into a state of consummation, which also involved corporeality. This idea of a resurrection and death is common today among many theologians, and not everyone is aware that Bronner is its author. Similarly, with respect to the virginity of the Blessed Virgin, Vorgrimler relates. In 1960, Rahner had written an article in which he had questioned the Catholic doctrine of the virginitas in partu, the doctrine that Mary remained a virgin perpetually after the birth of Jesus. He attempted to interpret this doctrine in his typical manner. He sought the nucleus of the statement. Now the invention of all the ancient writers who had said anything about the virginity of Mary was certainly not to express the biological or anatomical aspects. He came up with a religious and theological content. A person is a virgin who is wholly oriented on the fulfillment of the will of God, who is at God's disposal. Of course, in this deeper sense, married people, too, can be virgin. With this solution, Rahner succeeded in solving all the problems which arise from the mention in the Bible of the brothers of Jesus. In the next paragraph, Borgrimler remarks, This article caused serious disturbance in Roman circles. By implication, Rahner gives this kind of interpretation to many miracles in the New Testament, even the resurrection. In the latter, he is much more circumspect, but it can be found in his reference to the early faith, inspired by the Easter experience, suggesting that the physical resurrection of Christ was an interpretation by the overheated imagination of the disciples. Thus, his interpretations are clearly intended to stimulate and encourage doubt regarding divine intervention in the events of the New Testament. This is Rahner's version of demythologizing the Catholic faith. Part I. Rahner's view of sin and Christ as Redeemer. In Rahner's view of man as whole, integral, not fallen or corrupted, the idea of a crucified Christ as Redeemer of mankind from original and personal sin, the very foundation and beginning of the Catholic faith, is lost. According to Rahner, the supernatural existential in man, which is an inherent attraction of man toward God, is reciprocated by the permanent offer of God's self-communication and love. And the only real sin is the definitive obdurate refusal opposed to it. That is, not by individual acts offensive to God, but only by the definitiveness of life as a whole. With regard to the idea of redemption, Weger reports, Rahner rejects the theology of satisfaction, which has been current in Catholicism since the Middle Ages and according to which God forgives men's sins only by means of the infinite satisfaction of the God-man on the cross, because sin is an infinite offense against God. Bronner readily concedes that the idea of God's reconciliation with man by means of a sacrifice was widely accepted in Jewish society at that time as valid. On the other hand, the idea of sacrifice can help a modern man very little to understand the soteriological aspects of Jesus' crucifixion. Rahner does not see redemption as functioning mythologically, as though God had somehow to be made to change his mind by Jesus' crucifixion, and so led to save men in this way. God's will to save, Rahner has always taught, is stronger than human sin, and cannot be frustrated by human sin. Here we may note in passing that the theology of satisfaction and redemption is here attributed to the Middle Ages, a common theme among those who try to denigrate traditional Catholic teachings. By rejecting the theology of satisfaction, Rahner rejects all of the meaning of the sacrifice for the cross, the ultimate abandonment by Christ himself for our sake, 
our redemption from original sin and opening the possibility of reconciliation with God for the sins committed in this life. When the people asked Peter and the other apostles, What are we to do, my brothers? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, 37 through 38. By re oh my gosh. By denying Christ as Redeemer, Rahner has indeed emptied the cross of its meaning. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Part J. Rahner's view of the pre-Vatican II Church. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that Rahner detested the Catholic Church in which he was ordained. One may get an idea of Rahner's view of the preconciliar church by noting his vision on the church of the future as we have described it in the opening section. He abhorred authority, especially authority passed on by the arbitrary means of ordination, which is authority bestowed from above. He had a special antipathy toward the papacy. He questioned the teaching authority of the church and of any authority external to the person. He questioned the efficacy of the sacraments, and he sought to rid the church of superstition. For example, Rahner breaks radically with the traditional theology of the church, which did not begin from below, that is, with man himself, but has always insisted that dogmatic statements had to be taught to man in the form in which they had been received. Rahner's approach is quite different. Man is at the beginning for him, not the church's statement of faith. Weger, 15. Rahner's first step towards overcoming the process of incrustation and ossification of Christian teaching has been a hard and unrelenting confrontation between concrete dogmatic pronouncements and the experience of contemporary man. Weger, 15. Bronner has asked, Is it possible to learn about what we are taught to believe as Christians in any way that is not based on being instructed by an external authority? Weger, 8. For today, the social aids to religion are dying out. Not even the usual aid of a church kind, not even the sacraments, can keep alive a real relationship with God. For Grimler, 20. There should be no enforced indoctrination of the statements of faith. Weger, 8. Rahner did not feel the disappearance of the old, popular faith to be tragic. He saw here a decline of superstition, and at the same time, new opportunities. For Grimler, 16. Karl Rahner's remarks are far removed from any cult of the papacy or enthusiasm for it. For Grimler, 38. Rahner also spoke of peon monotheism, which threatened to make the church an immovable monolith, a mass of rock, an absolute monarchy, in which everything was governed and decided by the ruler down to the smallest detail. For Grimler, 54. This brutal assessment of the pre-Vatican II church hardly needs further commentary. Breaks radically with traditional theology. A hard and unrelenting confrontation. Not even the sacraments. No enforced indoctrination. Superstition, etc. It is indeed tragic that Rahner did not see the beauty in the church that so many others saw. The unity and comprehensiveness of its doctrines, the extraordinary mercy and grace of its sacraments, the beauty of its structure as the body of Christ, headed by a visible vicar of Christ, the beauty of its liturgy and music, the evidence of love and faith in all its great cathedrals. All this, alas, was lost to Rahner. Part 6. The Continuing Influence of Karl Rahner Cardinal Ratzinger has remarked, In this century, 
we have witnessed theological discoveries by men like de Lubac, Congar, Danilu, Rahner, Baltazar, and so forth. Here, entirely new perspectives opened up in theology, and Vatican II would not have been possible without them. From the foregoing description of Rahner's theology, the reader can no doubt identify in his or her own experience the continuing influence of his theology. These quotations from Pope John Paul II, for example, are almost perfect paraphrases of Rahner's teaching concerning anonymous Christianity. Thus, in the great religions, which the Church considers with respect and esteem in the way indicated by the Second Vatican Council, Christians recognize the presence of saving elements, which nevertheless operate independence on the influence of Christ's grace. Therefore, these religions can contribute, by virtue of the mysterious action of the Holy Spirit, to helping men on their way to eternal happiness. But this role is also the fruit of Christ's redemptive activity. Thus, with regard to other religions, Christ the Savior is also mysteriously at work. From the Observatorio Romano, February 11th, 1998. The Pope reaffirmed these ideas in a later address. The seeds of truth, present and active in the various religious traditions, are a reflection of the unique Word of God, who became flesh in Jesus Christ. They are, together, an effect of the Spirit of Truth, operating outside the visible confines of the mystical body. The various religions arose precisely from this primordial human openness to God. At their origins we often find founders who, with the help of God's Spirit, achieved a deeper religious experience, handed on to others. This experience took form in the doctrines, rites, and precepts of various religions. It will be in the sincere practice of what is good in their own religious traditions, and by following the dictates of their own conscience, that members of other religions respond positively to God's invitation and receive salvation in Jesus Christ even when they do not recognize or acknowledge him as their savior. Well, Observatore Romano, September 16th, 1998. The idea of a pan-religion of John Paul II, founded solely upon God the Father, and not requiring any acknowledgement of Jesus Christ, is exemplified in the following statement of the Pope. I hope that the dawn of the third millennium Sincere dialogue between Christians and Jews will help create a new civilization founded on the one holy and merciful God, and fostering a humanity reconciled in love. La Observatorio Romano, May 5th, 1999. Cardinal Ratzinger also evidently accepts the anonymous Christianity of Rahner. All is permeated by Christian forces. Instead of an anathema of division and purification, the Council gave a clarifying interpretation, which even in atheism still finds the hidden influence of the Christian reality. The Observatory Romano, December 8, 1995. The declaration Dominus Jesus, issued by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, August 6, 2000, expresses further this new ecclesiology, expanding on the entirely new idea, first introduced in the Vatican II document Lumen Gentium, that a Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Dominus Jesus goes on to say that this Church of Christ includes not only the Orthodox, an idea certainly acceptable to traditionalists, but also includes all of the Protestant communities. Quoting from Vatican II, Unitatis Redentio Gratio No. 3, the Declaration continues, Therefore, these separated communities as such 
though we believe they suffer from defects, have by no means been deprived of significance and importance in the mystery of salvation. For the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as a means of salvation. Paragraph 17. Dominus Jesus then goes on to discuss the non-Christian and pagan religions. Certainly, the various religious traditions contain and offer religious elements which come from God and are part of what the Spirit brings about in human hearts and in the history of peoples, in culture, and religions. Paragraph 21. Thus, we have a new ecclesiology of a Church of Christ, consisting of virtually all religions, Christian and pagan, a church evidently also subsisting within the Catholic Church, presumably at some inferior level. Every human being is a member of this Church of Christ, even if he explicitly rejects Christ, even if an atheist. If every person already shares, not simply potentially, but actually, in the graces of Christ, what reason does anyone have to change his current condition? By this pan-religion, the Pope has unilaterally disarmed the church militant. A traditionalist would say that as to Protestants, the Catholic Church has always taught that graces are always available to individuals who are properly disposed to receive them. But this new ecclesiology states that the religious institutions established by Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Cranmer, and others, established for the express purpose of opposing, persecuting, and ultimately destroying the Catholic Church, institutions that for centuries have vilified and actively preached hatred of the Catholic Church, these institutions are now to be viewed as valid and worthy vehicles, acceptable to the Holy Ghost for the distribution of Christ's merits, as to non-Christians and pagans, Pope Pius X had this to say in Pacendi Gregis. From this, venerable brethren, springs that most absurd tenet of the modernists, that every religion, according to the different aspect under which it is viewed, must be considered as both natural and supernatural. It is remarkable that Dominus Jesus admits in paragraph 14 though the authors have no firm basis for these declarations, by saying, Theology today is invited to explore if and in what way the historical figures and positive elements of these religions may fall within the divine plan of salvation. The obvious and very serious dangers in these statements, which inspire the Pope's ecumenism and interreligious dialogue and celebrations, provoked Attila Sinki Guimares to write his book Quo Vadis Petri? This discussion of the new ecclesiology of Vatican II, Pope John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger, is appropriate in this book on Karl Rahner, because these ideas, which fundamentally alter the role of the Catholic Church in the world, can, it would seem, only be explained in terms of Rahner's theory of anonymous Christianity. As we saw in section 5, part D of this book, Weger gave this explanation of Rahner's theory. Every person and every religion attempts to objectivize the transcendental revelation of God and to express that revelation with the result that a partial expression of at least authentic, categorical, real revelation is contained in each religion. Religions and philosophies or worldviews arise in the first place from the inner dynamism of man's spirituality, as manifested in his transcendental experiences. There are, in all religions, he believes, individual aspects of successful mediation, made possible by God's grace, of man's supernaturally transcendent relationship with God. It is difficult to conclude that the new ecclesiology is anything other than the anonymous Christianity of Rahner. We are therefore justified, I believe, in asking Pope John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger the following question. 
if you accept, as you evidently do, Rahner's theory of anonymous Christianity, which in turn is based upon his theory of the supernatural existential, then, to what extent do you also accept the other elements of Rahner's theology, as they are exposed in this book? It may also be useful to explore the possible influence of Rahner's theology on the development of the Novus Ordo. Rahner's intent of demythologizing the church, that is, explaining all events in rational, understandable terms, his disparagement of the ordained priesthood, his pursuit of a desacralized clergy, validated only by the acceptance of the laity, Rahner's rejection of the theory of satisfaction, of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. All of these have a direct bearing on the purpose and meaning of the supreme sacrament of the Catholic faith, the Eucharist, that supernatural gift of mercy and grace from Christ. Contemporary with Rahner, there was an apparently large group, exemplified by Henri de Lubac, later made cardinal by Pope John Paul II, who maintained that Eucharistic adoration and the emphasis upon the real presence, real, true, and substantial, was a distorted idea of the Eucharist, that this distortion was a medieval aberration, that a more proper view of the Eucharist is a symbolic one, and that the divine presence is more real in the scriptures than in the Eucharist. If we added to these considerations the participation of Protestant advisors to the commission that formulated the Novus Ordo, and recognized that their principal objectives would be to desacralize the Eucharist and to eliminate the idea of sacrifice, we have the basis for exploring the intentions of those who developed the Novus Ordo. If one accepts the idea of de Lubac, that the divine is more real in Scripture than in the Eucharist, then it would follow that we should have a liturgy and name different from the traditional sacrifice of the Mass. So it should not be surprising that in the Novus Ordo we do not have a unified integral liturgy of sacrifice, but rather a bifurcated, balanced liturgy of the Word and a liturgy of the Eucharist. Psalms and readings from the Old Testament were added to give weight to the liturgy of the Word to balance the liturgy of the Eucharist. And just as Cranmer, the great formulator of English Protestantism in the 1550s, did, the altar of sacrifice is replaced by a community table. Just as Cranmer did, Latin is displaced by vernacular. Just as Cranmer did, wine is introduced for common communion and distributed by lay persons accepted in the hand without kneeling. Words emphasizing sacrifice and propitiation are eliminated or minimized. Cranmer's objective, to destroy belief in the real presence, has also been the fruit, whether by design or not, of the Novus Ordo, with fewer than half of Catholics still believing in the traditional concept of the real presence. Cranmer's principal object, of course, was to undermine the authority of the Catholic Church, and what better way is there than to attack that most awesome power given to the priesthood, the power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ? Thus, all the threads of destruction of Cranmer, de Lubach, and Rahner become intertwined. As we have seen, Rahner's theology implicitly denies original sin. There is no reason to suspect that others in the church have some questions about original sin. In the book, Introduction to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, by Cardinals Ratzinger and Schonborn, we find the statement, A particularly delicate subject is original sin. Inasmuch as the doctrine of original sin was declared as dogma by the Council of Trent, why is it a particularly delicate subject? Two initiatives of Rahner that are little known but have had a serious impact on the Catholic Church were con celebration of Mass and the rise of the permanent lay, usually married, diaconate. Prior to Vatican II, 
the church opposed Khan's celebration of Mass for a very good reason. It gives a false impression of the priesthood for five priests to simultaneously consecrate the same bread and wine, while the principal celebrating priest has this authority and power all by himself. Also, if five priests can celebrate one Mass, it diminishes the number of Masses that would have been offered by the four extra priests. In the matter of the diaconate, for hundreds of years this has been principally a step toward the priesthood. The diaconate, promoted by Rahner, and that has expanded explosively since Vatican II, is meant to be a permanent lay diaconate, usually married, with no prospect of the priesthood. Grimler comments on page 100, Rahner worked with incredible persistence for the renewal of the diaconate. To Rahner, this, no doubt, was a step toward the future church of a non-priestly character. At least in the church in the United States, the diaconate is to some extent displacing the priesthood. In the Diocese of Austin, for example, it is reported that over one period of time there were 47 ordinations of deacons and only of one priest. The June 1st, 2000 issue of The Wanderer reports the acceptance of this development. In Rochester, New York, Bishop Clark recently wrote about his wonderful meeting with his deacons, who he acknowledged will be running a lot more parishes in the future. Of course, these deacons will not be able to provide consecration of bread and wine, or absolution and confession, but then, what would we expect in a declericalized church? A further influence of Rahner can be seen in the rampant subjectivism in the church today. It is a natural development from Rahner's theology in which every person has the innate capability of receiving and interpreting revelation equal to the Old and New Testaments, and his opposition to any external teaching authority. We should not be surprised to find in Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 16, that conscience is reduced to what is written in the heart, without reference to experience, teaching, or revelation, as this is further interpreted by such as Pope John Paul II, Father Avery Dulles, and Dr. Janet Smith. There appears to be no difference in their thinking between the nature and the extent of the Holy Ghost dwelling in the Church, the body of Christ and the charisms of the Holy Ghost received by the laity. This interpretation, in turn, would seem to arise from an acceptance of Rahner's supernatural existential, self-revelation, and absolute personal autonomy. However, a full exploration of this complex subject, involving personal conscience, authority, Natural law and revelation must await another book. Part 7. Criticism of Rahner As I mentioned early in this commentary, I have found no critical analysis of Rahner's theology in English, and my principal sources for this commentary are his early students and long-time associates, Laura Grimler and Weger, who are wholly favorable to him. However, Borgrimler does include a chapter on criticism of Rahner, as well as commenting in other sections on his difficulties with the hierarchy and with some of his peers. I have already mentioned his differences with von Balthasar. I will quote only one particularly strong criticism from chapter 13 of Borgrimler's work, a quotation from a fellow German, one George May, a former Mainz church lawyer. A theology which serves each everyday need, which justifies everything and excuses what should properly be called guilt and stubbornness, becomes an ideology. It ought to be equally clear that such a theology digs its own grave. It is a theology which fits in with the twilight of a German Catholicism. Rahner has served his Munich sponsors faithfully, but he is now in ruins, along with the whole fiasco of the reforms that he shaped and introduced. With his theology, Rahner sought to build up the church. He has contributed towards knocking it down. 
I found a limited criticism of Rahner in Cardinal Ratzinger's Principles of Catholic Theology. The Cardinal begins, This broadly outlined thesis of Rahner's has something dazzling, something stupendous about it. The particular and universal, history and being, seem to be reconciled. But then he continues, But is that really the answer? Is it true that Christianity adds nothing to the universal, but merely makes it known? Is the Christian really just man as he is? Baroner, man is, in fact, a self-transcendent being. Hence, the God-man can be deduced as the savior of mankind in terms of man's own being. As a successful form of human transcendence, or in other words, as the utterance of God in a finite subject. Christ, the Redeemer, is the expression and realization of the human universal. Ratzinger continues, Rahner tried to prove that universal reason leads ultimately to the teachings of Christianity. In that case, one can, in fact, one must, interpret what is Christian in terms of the universal finding of man's reason. Rahner's intermingling of history and being in the concept of the absolute bringer of salvation leads to a spirituality of self-affirmation and the identification of humanness as such with the notion of what it means to be Christian. The Cardinal then writes, It seems to me that he has attempted too much. This revelation seems to him to reveal the horizon from which man can come to understand with God's own understanding. But revelation has given us no world formula. Man does not find salvation in reflective finding of himself, but in being taken out of himself that goes beyond our reflection. Not in continuing to be himself, but in going out from himself. In Milestones, Cardinal Ratzinger remarks that, As we worked together, it became obvious to me that, despite our agreement in many desires and conclusions, Rahner and I lived on two different theological planets. In questions such as liturgical reform, the new place of exegesis in the church and in theology, and in many other areas, he stood for the same things as I did, but for entirely different reasons. His was a speculative and philosophical theology in which scripture and the fathers in the end did not play an important role. But do these criticisms by the Cardinal constitute a rejection of Rahner's entire theology of transcendental anthropology? In the previous section 6, The Continuing Influence of Karl Rahner, I pointed out that the Pope and the Cardinal's concept of ecumenism could only be explained by an acceptance of Rahner's theory of anonymous Christianity, which in turn is based upon Rahner's supernatural existential. It would appear, then, that Cardinal Ratzinger's criticism of Rahner is ambiguous, nuanced, and limited. The Cardinal's overall comment on Rahner, that he attempted too much, is a very mild censure indeed. Part 8 Final comments. It is hoped that this brief analysis of the theology of Karl Rahner will enable Catholic readers to identify the source of some of the more curious and puzzling developments they encounter in the present-day Catholic Church. One general comment may be made here. The terminology of modern philosophy has intruded into Catholic scholarship with disastrous consequences. Catholic theologians no longer speak in terms that are comprehensible to ordinary Catholics. For us simple folk, the language of the New Testament with traditional interpretation is much more clear and comprehensible than that of the psychobabble of existentialism and phenomenology. St. Thomas may be difficult, but if one masters a few essential terms, terms that can be precisely defined, one can understand what he was saying. 
As Alasdair McIntyre has said, modern philosophy has become a virtual tower of Babel, with one school of philosophy with its own esoteric vocabulary, and another school entirely incomprehensible to the other. The Thomistic method of testing ideas against all of their possible objections, which McIntyre suggests is still valid, is the only way of resolving differences. But this depends upon the development of a common vocabulary, which at present does not exist. It is my hope that competent scholars will be examining and publishing criticisms of Rahner from the archives of the Vatican and from his contemporary critics. And I also hope that anything published will be transcribed into the language that the ordinary Catholic can understand and be decoded from the esoteric language of Rahner and his associates, as I have attempted to do in this commentary. Beware, lest any man cheat you by philosophy and vain deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 When I sent you out with no purse or bag or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, But now, let him who has a purse take it, and likewise a bag. And let him who has no sword sell his mantle and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. Luke chapter 22, verses 35 through 37.